What's up? I'm B, and whether you are watching this on YouTube or you are listening to the podcast, I hope you are having an amazing day. Today, we are going to be talking about things that are a little bit lighter on my channel. I just wanted to do something kind of fun and switch it up. So in today's video slash episode, we are going to be bringing back Tell Me Your Win. I'm going to be giving you a mild take that I have because it's by no means a hot take, but it's something I want to talk about. And then I am going to be answering some questions from an anonymous Q&A that I did on Instagram that I have not yet answered because there were a lot of questions, so I didn't get to all of them. But let's start with tell me your win. If you have been watching my channel for a long time, you'll know that I used to do live streams every week. And just because of some external factors, I had to start doing them less and less. And now, unfortunately, doing live streams just doesn't fit in with my schedule but at the beginning of every live stream while I was waiting for you know people to come in, everybody to, to sort of get settled, I did something called Tell Me Your Win. And uh, that was just asking you to share something from the past week that happened that made you happy or made you feel good. It didn't have to be this huge, grandiose thing. It, if it was, that was amazing and we celebrated just as hard. But it was really more about finding the small things in life that were worth being thankful for and worth celebrating as well. And it was really fun. It made me feel good. And I think it made the people who participated feel good to be able to share those things. So I want to bring it back even if I'm not doing a live stream. As far as my wins for the week, I would say that I have two. The first one is going to City Tacos with my husband for dinner. If you live in Phoenix, you need to go to City Tacos because it's so good. It's authentic Mexican food. Like, the tacos, burritos, all that, it just comes with meat. And then they give you a side of grilled onions and a jalapeno. And then they also have a salsa bar where you can get like cabbage, pico, guacamole, all that stuff. And you can like really customize it however you want. But it's just delicious. So that was amazing. And then my second win, which makes me realize like how much of an adult, how much of an adult I am, because it still is weird sometimes to think about the fact that like, I am an adult who can choose to do whatever I want to do. Like nobody is telling me what to do. I'm just allowed to like make decisions for myself. I cleaned out my fridge. And when I say cleaned out, I mean I took everything out of it. I took all the shelves out and like the little bins on the side. I washed them. I wiped down the inside of the fridge, you know, like little breadcrumbs, stuff like that. Vacuumed those out cleaned everything, went through everything because for some reason in my mind, I don't think about condiments expiring. So even if I haven't used like a Frank's red hot sauce in a year, I just, I leave it in there. Turns out condiments expire, which obviously I knew, but you know, like I said, I don't really think about it in practice. And so I went through all my condiments, got rid of everything that, um, you know, was no longer good. Thankfully there were only like three three condiments that I had to get rid of, but we hadn't even used them in such a long time. So whatever, cleaned those out, reorganized everything, put it back together and looking in the fridge now, it's just so organized. It's like, put it puts me at peace. We came home from Costco and I was like, I have room for all of this stuff because there's no clutter in here. Everything is organized. Everything's where it should be. And I loved it. So those are my wins for the week. Please tell me if you're watching this on YouTube, go into the comment section and tell me your win. And if you are listening to the podcast on Spotify, there is a Q&A section. So if you're, if you're listening there, use that Q&A section. Tell me your win. And again, it doesn't have to be something massive or life-changing to be considered a win. I've been thinking about this a lot more, especially since I've started using TikTok because I've tried to avoid it. I know myself, I'll get like sucked in and just waste so much time on there. And so I'm being very conscious about how I'm using it. But on TikTok, whether something is good or bad, if somebody's posting about it, it's like the best thing in the world or the worst thing in the entire world. And I think we run into some issues when everything is taken to an extreme with the bad things, obviously, but even with the good. I think it kind of makes you feel, I mean, you being kind of like an abstract you, maybe not you necessarily, but I think when you see all of these big things happening on social media, like when you're celebrating a birthday or an anniversary or somebody getting a new job, 
And it's just like the biggest, most extravagant celebration ever. It makes you feel like you're doing something wrong. Like you're not living your life to the fullest extent that you could be because you didn't get 12 dozen roses on your birthday. Like it makes you feel like first and foremost, if you're not doing those things for other people, then maybe you don't have the resources to do it. And so you feel bad about that, or you don't have the time to think about planning these things. And you're just like, wow, you know, all these people are doing so much better in life than me. And and that sucks. And then on the opposite end, you see people doing things like buying 12 dozen roses for their girlfriend. And you're like, wow, why doesn't my partner do that for me? Why doesn't my partner take me on a surprise trip to Madrid? Like you see these wonderful things happening for other people and it's great that they're happening for them. But I think then it also makes you question like, well, why wouldn't my partner want to do that for me? Is is something wrong with me? Does he not care about me? When in reality, stuff like that takes a lot of time, effort and money and not everybody has that. And that's okay to not go all out like that for every little thing. And so I think when you're on social media apps like Instagram and TikTok and YouTube, you have to be really aware that a lot of those things are being played up because they're meant to be put on social media. They're probably meant to create a false idea of what that person's life looks like day to day in order to get clicks and and views and attention. And that's I don't know. When you think about it, it's kind of like dystopian and sad. And I feel like if you know young people in your life, it, it it makes me worry for the young people that I know who think that like TikTok and Instagram are reality. This is how things are. A lot of us were lucky enough to grow up before social media existed. And so we didn't really have anything to compare our lives to other than the people that we knew in real life who were living their real lives. But the younger generations, they just see this and and they take it as it is. And so like teaching social media literacy and just explaining to them why people might post things that aren't true and helping them understand that is really, really important. So anyway, the whole point of talking about that is little things are still worth celebrating. Even if you think they're little, they're still a win. Even if they don't seem like this big life changing thing, They are still worthy of being appreciative for and and saying like, this is a good thing and I'm happy that this thing happened and they deserve to be celebrated and so do you. So like I said, tell me your win. I can't wait to hear it and celebrate. The next thing I want to talk about, like I said, it's a mild take. It's not a hot take. It's just, it's just a mild thing that I want to talk about. We need to stop calling everything X gate or blank Gate. This is inspired by Michaela Neguera. I think I'm saying her last name right. I heard it a bunch of different ways, but most commonly I hear Neguera. So that's what I'm going with. And apologies if that's not correct. But with this whole L'Oreal mascara thing, where if you haven't seen it, um, she was doing what is most likely a sponsored ad without properly disclosing that it was a sponsored ad for this new mascara. And the end product was not simply mascara on her eyes. The uh, speculation and general theory, I guess I will say, is that she added little like individual wispies to the end of her lashes or to like the outer corner and she didn't cop to it basically. I mean, I've seen the pictures. It looks like she has a little falsy on there and somebody actually found a video where she was like, this is my mascara hack. And she showed herself doing that. It was a completely unrelated video from a while back, but it shows that like that's something she's done before. So it's not out of the realm of possibility that it's something she would do again, especially on a sponsored post, because if she can make it look like these results are so amazing and incredible, the video is going to get a lot more views and they'll probably want to keep working with her because of the attention that it got. And obviously when a video gets more views and attention and you get more followers, more money, more fame, more clout, all of that. And she hasn't addressed it. She kind of like made a joke out of it in the video right after where she was like, we all know why we're here today because it's the month of love. Let's do a Valentine's Day look. So the way she handled it was not great. I mean, it's probably going to make it so that more people move on from it quickly because she's not going to give an apology or an explanation for people to pick apart. So technically, like social media wise, it's a smart move, but 
I don't know that it's one with a lot of integrity. And really, the main reason I wanted to talk about it is because everyone's calling this Lashgate. And I feel like we need to expand our like scandal name vernacular. I feel like the main two kind of word plays that are done in social media are like Dramageddon, because we have Dramageddon 1, 2, and 3, and then blank gate, you know, like with Jacqueline Hill, we had lipstick gate. And so I see that quite a bit and I want us to expand. So this is going to be a little bit nerdy, but I was looking up like famous scandal names in history and I didn't want them to be really like heavy names that we're making wordplay on. So I found two that I just thought were kind of interesting. And I'm like, maybe we can build on these. The first one is called the Teapot Dome Scandal. And this is from the Britannica website. It says President Warren G. Harding apparently was a very nice guy, albeit a philanderer who really didn't know how to pick his friends. Many members of the Ohio gang who had ascended to high political office by hitching their wagons to Harding's rising star became embroiled in a scandal. Attorney General Harry Doherty, Harding's longtime campaign manager, was accused of selling government supplies of alcohol during Prohibition. Charles R. Forbes, head of the Veterans Bureau, was convicted on bribery and corruption charges. But the scandal for which Harding is remembered was engineered by Secretary of the Interior Albert B. Fall. Two large oil reserves, Elk Hills, California, and Teapot Dome near Casper, Wyoming, had been preserved for the energy needs of the U.S. Navy. Fall persuaded Harding to transfer control of the reserves from the Navy to the Department of the Interior. Then, in 1921 to 1922, without seeking competitive bids, Fall leased Elk Hills to oil tycoon Edward L. Doheny of the Pan American Petroleum. I don't know if that's how you say it, but that's what it looks like of the Pan American Petroleum Company and Teapot Dome to Harry F. Sinclair of Mammoth Oil. Subsequent congressional investigations into the Teapot Dome scandal revealed that Fall had received as much as $400,000 in payments and loans as a bribe to facilitate the leases, which were subsequently terminated by Congress. Fall was convicted of accepting bribes and became the first sitting cabinet member to be imprisoned. So that's like a little kind of scammy thing. Nobody was murdered like there wasn't anything super dark there wasn't like an assault involved in this it's just like little shady business deals going on behind the scenes and then the next one is called the whiskey ring scandal and it says like harding ulysses s grant was seen as a man of great personal integrity but also like harding grant was a poor judge of character and his presidential administration was awash in corruption In 1869, Grant's cronies Jay Gould and James Fisk brought on the Black Friday stock market crisis. Before the 1872 election, Grant dispatched Internal Revenue Supervisor General John McDonald to Missouri to bolster waning political support. McDonald rewarded Grant's trust by establishing the Whiskey Ring, a multi-state criminal network in which whiskey distillers, treasury and internal revenue agents, shopkeepers, and others worked together by manipulating liquor taxes to defraud the federal government of some $1.5 million per year by 1873. In 1875, as Treasury Secretary Benjamin Bristow was breaking up the ring, Grant appointed a special prosecutor, John B. Henderson. When Henderson began closing in on Grant's personal secretary, Orville E. Babcock, and intimated that Grant might be involved, the president fired and replaced Henderson. Convinced that Babcock was innocent, Grant testified on his behalf. Babcock went free, but 110 of the 237 other individuals who were indicted were convicted. So again, we've got some shady dealings. we got a little secret organization going on. We are getting that money. And so I think we can use these. We have some things to play off of in terms of naming scandals and, and like doing wordplay. We could do the L'Oreal ring or Mascara Dome. We can, we can take these. I know these are lesser known scandals and saying like Lashgate is very easily identifiable as a reference to Watergate. But let's get these creative juices flowing. There's so much creativity on the internet. Why can't we come up with more wordplay for scandals than simply Dramageddon and Lashgate? And I think that we could expand this to be a little bit broader. Like we can focus on concepts or organizations more than just specific scandals. Like if we think about Scientology, the founder of Scientology, L. Ron Hubbard, was a little bit of a swindler. And so we could refer to her as like L. Ron Naguera or with Theranos and, and Elizabeth Holmes. We can call her Michaela Holmes. We could call it Thera Mascara. I don't know. I I love to think about these things and think about ways that we can make things a little bit more creative and and interesting. So just a thought, my mild take of the week, not everything has to be X gate. 
And if you have any ideas, I would love to hear them. I think wordplay is really fun. I know some people don't love it, but I think it's fun. And it's like a cool brain exercise to be a little bit creative and think about things differently than what it seems like is the most natural line of thought or, you know, the the most popular line of reasoning. It's cool to think about things from a different perspective, even if it's something as simple as like the name of an internet scandal. So if you have any, I would love to hear them because I know that you'll come up with some good ones. All right. And finally, it is time to answer some of your questions because like I said at the beginning, I did an anonymous uh, Q&A on Instagram through NGL and I got a lot of questions. So I burnt out of steam a little bit on answering them in writing. And so I figured I would just answer them in a video. The first question is, have you ever struggled with your faith? If so, why? And also, how did you handle it? And there's like two things that pop into my mind with this. and They're each of kind of a different nature. So I'll answer with both of them. The first uh, situation that's coming to my mind was in eighth grade. We were living in one town, like my family and I. And I really liked my friends. I liked my school. Like everything was going great. And then my parents both got jobs at a new church that was like an hour away. And my mom had asked me how I would feel if they ended up like taking them or they got job offers. But she was like, how would you feel if we took these jobs and we moved? And at the time, I was just like, oh, yeah, it's only an hour away. No big deal. But then when it actually happened and I had to leave my friends and leave my school and leave the familiar things that was really, really tough. And it, it just was like moving is hard in general, I guess, but even tougher when you are still developing and like you have to start a new school and meet new people and get involved in new activities and try out for the new sports teams that you want to be on and nobody knows you. And it just was a tough time. And so I didn't talk to anybody about it really when um, it was happening, but I was just like, if God exists, like, why does this hurt so bad? Why would he allow me to feel this awful? And it's kind of interesting, like, looking back on it, because things weren't bad when I moved. Like, it was definitely an adjustment, but people were nice to me at my new school. Like, I made the cheer team. I didn't really have any issues with anybody. Like, things things were okay school-wise, but um, I've talked about this before at the church, there was a girl who right off the bat did not like me, was very mean to me my first week there. And that was for her own personal reasons that like it, it happened so long ago. It's like whatever it is, what it is. Um, but like that was really tough was going to church and knowing that like there was a preconceived notion about who I was because she was like the first person I interacted with. And so that was really hard. And again, I was just like, God is real. Like, why does this hurt so bad? And so I just journaled about it. I prayed about it. Like I thought about it a lot. And I'm like, you know, if, if you're here, I'm going to trust that this is going to get better, that things are going to evolve and it's not going to be like this forever. And I just kept going to church, kept praying. And eventually those feelings of doubt went away. Um, and, and I just kind of realized like a tough time doesn't negate the existence, the existence of God. And of course, if you are atheist or you have a different belief system, you're totally fine, totally welcome here. I'm not telling you what you have to believe, but just in my personal opinion and how I felt about the situation and how I feel about God, a, a negative experience or a tough time doesn't mean that God doesn't exist. And so I think it's totally normal to have a faith crisis or to have doubts, even as adults, like even as you get older, to have those feelings of doubt because it's, it's kind of like human nature. You can't see something. And so how can you really be sure that it's there? I don't think it's ever something to feel ashamed of or be like, oh, I'm a bad Christian because I have a moment where I'm, where I'm questioning God or where I'm questioning uh, the, the things that are happening in my life or the existence of God. And I think it's really important to like talk about those things and share your own experience. And then the second situation was one where I wasn't questioning the, the existence of God, but it made me not want to be involved in the church. And again, this happened like t over 10 years ago now. So I'm over it. But because I'm sharing the story, I will talk about it. It just feels like it's so petty to talk about, but it's what happened and I'm answering the question. So um, 
again, at the church that I went to, I had this group of friends and there was like a shift that happened where um, it was like them against me and they didn't like me anymore and they were doing some very mean things to me and I don't know, I've always been a person that's just kind of like, oh, well, it is what it is or like I don't want to fight back. I'm not like a person who's really going to fight you or like push back up against you. I'm just going to be like, that sucks that you're doing this to me. And so um, I, I just wanted to remove myself from the situation. It wasn't getting better. People saw that it was happening and it sucked. And so um, I remember talking to my mom about it and she was like, okay, well, you don't have to go to high school service anymore. You don't have to be involved in high school small groups because she saw how much it sucked. But she told me, I think it's really important that you tell your student pastor what's happening because I guarantee you he doesn't know. And if he knew, he would not be okay with with that happening. And like these things making you feel like you can't be involved in high school ministry. She's like, I think you need to tell him. That way he at least has the opportunity to try and solve it. So I was like, okay. So I went and I told him what was happening. And I was like, and you know, so for those reasons, I'm not going to be coming to high school ministry anymore. And he goes, okay. (laughs) And I was like, okay. So after that, I obviously stopped going to high school service and I just went to the adult service with my parents and Um, my relationship with the church was really touchy for a few years after that. Um, it wasn't necessarily a priority to me to go to the church because I was like, well, I can read the Bible and I can learn things and I can have a personal relationship with God and I don't need to be here. Like I don't need to be at a church where these not like bad things happen to me, but like where these people were mean to me and I don't want to be here. I don't need to be here. And so Like I said, for a few years, it was just kind of like, I'll go, but I'm not looking to like dive in or or be super involved. I want to kind of keep my distance. And thankfully, I am over that now. (laughs) My husband and I really, really like, we go to a different church than the church I went to then. Um, But I really, really like my church. It's great. And I do feel like, obviously, speaking to Christians, like you can do your faith and your religion, however you want to do it. But I do think there is value in being around people and kind of realizing that bad things can happen at church. And that doesn't mean that there's no good that can happen there either. Obviously, if you have like bad leadership or you have people who are uh, kind of like living a, a secret double life and doing all these shady things behind the scenes, that's not a healthy church and you, you know, you do not need to be there. You can leave. But when you find a church that aligns with your values, the pastor is very knowledgeable and and it makes you feel like you are gaining something by going. It's really, really valuable to go there and to be around other people who have the same beliefs as you do. And you just have to realize that like, just because it's a church and just because it's a, a religious place um, doesn't mean it's filled with perfect people we're all imperfect and so there's going to be disagreements and discord and people not getting along people not liking each other like we are all imperfect humans capable of making mistakes and capable of hurting other people whether it's intentional or not and that doesn't mean that there's no value in going and having that community so that was one where again it it didn't make me question the existence of God but it really turned me off from being involved in organized religion for quite a while. And it was just something that I had to kind of work through in my own way and in my own timing. The next question is, what are a few of your favorite hobbies? So I was thinking about this one and I'm like, I do not have a ton of time for hobbies right now. Uh, I work full time and YouTube, like creating content is a hobby, which I really enjoy. But between working, doing content creation and um, talked about this a little bit, before, but not in much detail or depth. And I'm sure eventually I will. But right now, there's so many things that we're just trying to figure out. Um, My husband had a foot and ankle surgery in October of 2021. And it's just been like one thing after another. And so we're spending a lot of time dealing with the resulting issues from that surgery. 
So between those three things and then just like day-to-day life stuff of cooking, cleaning, grocery shopping, making sure the house is stocked up, playing with the dog, all that, don't really have a ton of time for many extra things. But something that I have really enjoyed in the past when I did have more free time was crocheting. I think that that's just a really fun and relaxing thing to do. And it just it's cool to make something, especially something that you can use because it's cool to make art, like just to have art. Um, but when you can make something and then actually use it, I just think that that's really fun and a really kind of like satisfying thing to do. And then other than that, the only other thing that really comes to mind is I do like to bake and I like to um, try new desserts and make things that aren't just like cookies or cakes, you know, try and expand my capabilities there as well as cooking and, and trying new recipes because food is so fun. Like it's really, again, I think it's that thing of being creative with something that is then useful. And so you, you bake or you cook and you can eat the thing that you made. And I think that that's really fun. The next question is, what kind of music do you like? And I always feel so lame answering this question. I don't listen to a lot of music. I just don't. Like, it's, I, I like specific artists and specific songs, but there are some people who just always love having music playing in the background and in the car and all that, and it's just not for me. I much prefer having podcasts on or YouTube videos as my background noise, so not a huge music person, but some of my favorite artists or bands would have to be Paramore, Fleetwood Mac, Mr. Wives, Haim, um, The Cure. That's like my top five, I guess. And then I'm thinking about it now because I am seeing Paramore with Taylor Swift in March. I'm so excited. Like I, I still kind of can't believe I got tickets. I keep looking at my wallet like in my phone. Cause I'm like, I don't believe this is real. Like I have the tickets. I, I got, I, I got these tickets. I did. I got the tickets. And that makes me think about how I don't necessarily like listening to music at home or at work in the car, whatever, but I'll always go to a concert. Like I'm down. If, if, if somebody's coming and you want to see them, let's go, let's do it. So I like live music, but just having it on in the background or sitting and listening to music just isn't really my thing. <laughs> if you're watching the video version of this, I have switched from a coffee mug to a wine glass. I filmed the first part of this before work and now it's after work and I actually have a mocktail in here. Um, this is Bon Buzz, which it's like an adaptogenic liquor alternative. It has 5-HTP and caffeine in it and I really like it. So that's the spicy one. And then I put agave in it and a strawberry Waterloo and it's really good. So yes, second half of this is being filmed after work, but let's get back to the questions. This next question is very sweet, and I am answering it because it was asked, but it does feel a little bit like trying to like pump myself up kind of. The question is, has your amazing ability to be such an open, loving, and welcoming Christian come from the church you grew up in, the example set forth by your family, or your own understanding of Christian teachings, or a bit of all or some of these factors. And I think that it, it would be both my family that I grew up in. And I hate to be like, it's me. That's why I'm so open and loving. But you know, I understand the spirit of the question is like, I'm a very progressive Christian. And I think that the way I speak about faith is very different from what we tend to see on social media and if you see like religious social media personalities, I do think that my perspectives and my views are pretty different from what like the norm would be considered to be. So um, yeah, like half and half. Uh, my family, so kind, loving, generous, just like my parents are amazing people and so I feel very, very lucky that I got to grow up with them as my parents and um, they've they've always been the kind of people, as my mom would say, uh, to want to remain teachable and, and that means like don't think that you know everything. Always understand that you can learn more and you can understand more and maybe some things that you had, like some perspectives you had in the past might not be the correct perspective or, you know, that might be an outdated perspective and you can learn and grow and change and evolve. And so I think that that was a really great example for me to have. 
growing up is like parents who um, weren't like, we're perfect. We know everything. This is how it's supposed to be. That's like, that was super valuable to have. And then as far as like, it's the nature versus nurture thing. I do think that I've always just kind of been someone who, I don't know. I, I feel like I want to know about other people and I want to learn more and I'm curious about things. And whenever I heard something in church, I heard it and I was like, I'm taking this in. I understand it, but I would always want to think more about how I personally felt about it. And I think kind of a a funny example of that just kind of being my nature is um, when I was in high school, I was a camp counselor for uh, like fifth and sixth grade girls. And we went out to camp and there was a lesson that had been taught. And we had these booklets of these questions that we were supposed to ask. And I was reading the questions and I'm just like, I don't think I want to ask these girls these questions. Like, I don't think they're going to get very much from this if, if these are the questions that I ask them. And so while they were in like general session, I I went to the side and I wrote my own questions for them. And we did the discussion questions that I came up with because I, I thought that they would get more out of that. And obviously, um, like, like thinking back on it now, maybe that was a little bit cavalier for a junior in high school to do. Like, I don't know, maybe uh, I could have sought help from someone else to be like, hey, do you think these questions are good? But from my memory of it, the girls had a great discussion. It wasn't anything where I was like trying to ask them extreme questions or like push a narrative that wouldn't have been accepted by the church or anything. It was just me coming up with a little bit more creative questions to get a better conversation flowing. So it's funny now that I'm thinking about it, I'm like, 16 or 17 year old changing the curriculum at a church camp. I don't know, maybe not a great choice, but in the end, it worked out for the best. I think in this situation, it worked out well. And also, uh, thank you for perceiving me in that way. That sounds so weird to be like, thank you for thinking that I am kind and loving. But um, coming from the perspective of knowing that a lot of people interact with Christians who frankly, aren't nice, aren't kind, aren't loving. I feel very honored that I can be someone that you see on the internet who um, shows you that not all Christians are going to be judgmental and bigoted and like angry and out to condemn everything because I feel like that definitely does not represent what Christianity should be. And it makes me sad that a lot of people kind of see me as an exception. Again, it sounds really arrogant, but just based on comments I've gotten, I've seen a lot of comments of people being like, I have no interest in religion, but I enjoy hearing about it coming from you or hearing your perspective or people saying like, you're the first Christian I've ever heard talk about their faith. That doesn't make me feel like I'm worthless or I'm bad or wrong. And so it does make me kind of it's sad to hear that. This is like the first time you're being exposed to a Christian who isn't just out to like, judge and condemn everything, but I am very grateful that I have the opportunity to show that side of Christianity and um, I do not take that honor lightly. The next question is, any advice on dealing with homophobic parents slash family as a Christian? I get these kind of questions a lot and I feel bad because I don't always know that I have the best advice to give to someone in this situation because um, I've, I'm straight, you know, I, I feel like I am lacking in this purely because I don't have the personal experience. And also I don't ever want to say like my, my first thought is, you know, just, just be who you are and know that God loves you. And if your parents don't accept you right away, you might have to distance yourself and you might have to, to step away and just say, well, I'm going to distance myself in love because I do love you and I care about you. But if this is going to be a problem for our relationship where you can't accept me for who I am, then I need to make sure I'm taking care of myself and protecting myself. And so I will be putting some distance there. But that advice is so general because what if you're in high school? What if you live with them and you don't have the option to separate yourself? What if you 
come out and you know things escalate to a dangerous situation and i don't say that to fear monger i just say that knowing there are a wide variety of reactions that can occur if someone is homophobic and so um, I understand that people might not always have the opportunity to say, like, this is who I am, and if you can't accept it, then it is what it is. So if you are um, a Christian or you grew up in a household where your parents were Christian and you ended up having to come out to them, would you just leave a comment down below giving some advice or some wisdom, maybe sharing your experience to make whoever asked this question feel like they are understood and there are other people out there who can identify with them and have been through the same sort of thing, um, the same, you know, situation, even if the details aren't exactly the same, but just to show them that they're not alone and um, in the long run, everything will be okay. It is basically all I can tell you right now, it might not feel okay. You might feel like your parents will never understand you and you know, it's going to be like the worst thing in the world to tell them who you are. And it might be really difficult. You might come out to them and it might be that they are going to condemn you and judge you and not want anything to do with you. And if that's what happens, in the long run, it will be all right. Like it will hurt, I am sure. I cannot imagine the hurt of that. But God does love you and you will find other people who make you feel that love and make you feel that acceptance. And it's a really sad thing when a relationship with the parent breaks down. But depending on the situation, it's better to not have a relationship with a toxic family member than to hold on to something that is toxic for fear of losing it or for fear of judgment and um I would just encourage you to live your life with love and integrity and come from a place of saying like I'm living in my truth and I love you and I, and I hope that you are understanding and, and willing to hear me out and, and open your mind a little bit and you never know. It might it might surprise you their reaction and, and if it does then that's great and you've made an amazing step forward. And if they react in the way you expect them to react, then at least you know. And that's also a big step forward because you are going to be living in integrity and in truth. I don't know if any of that is helpful. So if it's not, feel free to disregard it. You do not have to take my advice, but just know in the long run, it'll be okay. And you will find people who love you like family. You might miss that relationship if, if your parents decide they don't want to love you and engage in you and, and accept who you are. Um, it'll definitely be a loss, but it will end up being okay. The next one is, any advice for college? Worried I'll go to the wrong one or won't enjoy it, etc. Needing peace with this. Let me tell you, this is coming from someone who... Um, for a while, I felt like I definitely picked the wrong college. I was not thinking about long-term goals and, um, I gave up on some things that in my heart, I know I really wanted to pursue in order to be, um, closer to a boyfriend and that relationship ended up not working out. And for a while, I really beat myself up because I was like, dang, you know, the whole reason I went to this campus at this school was for this relationship. And yeah, like I joined a sorority. I'm having fun. There's good times, whatever. But like, I really wanted to pursue this thing and I couldn't because they didn't offer this major at this campus. And if I had just thought a little bit more with my brain and logic and, and done the thing that I wanted to do, then things might look really different in my life right now. But I think kind of the steps we take lead us to where we're eventually supposed to be. And I can tell you, I would not have met my husband if I did not choose to go to the college that I went to and I didn't choose to attend the specific campus of that college that I attended. That's how we ended up meeting each other and connecting with each other. And so it's just kind of something that you could never predict, you could never think to happen. And 
being with my husband is one of the biggest blessings in my entire life. And if I had chosen to go to a different school or a different campus, I probably wouldn't have met him. Maybe God would have orchestrated things in a way to allow us to run into each other in, in a different scenario. But in this case, this is how it happened. And so every choice you make is going to lead you where you're eventually supposed to be. Going to college, there's going to be rough times. There's going to be growing pains. Moving out is definitely interesting. It comes with its own set of responsibilities and fears and issues and fun and excitement. And so going there will be an adjustment. Motivating yourself to go to class will be an adjustment. Unless you know for a fact that you are the earliest riser in the world, let me give you a, a very sound piece of advice and tell you do not take 8 a.m. classes. Don't do it. Unless you are someone who wakes up at like 4 a.m. like clockwork, don't take 8 a.m. classes. You will not go. <laughs> so I can give you that one specific piece of advice. Do not do it. And the final question is, could you make a video centered around LGBTQ plus and the problems in the church regarding this as I know you're more progressive? I go back to the question before the last one. I am very open to making a video like that, but I would not want to come from a place of not having personal experience and struggling with feeling like me talking about it isn't helpful. So if you guys have specific suggestions of how you would want me to address it or what things specifically you would want me to address, I would so be open to that. Or if there is somebody that you want me to have on my channel, someone who is um, maybe like a religious influencer who is part of the LGBTQ plus community or somebody who maybe they're not an influencer, but they have sort of an online presence. And even if they're not a Christian, they're not part of a church anymore. They have experience growing up in a church or a religious household being part of that community. And they can speak to struggles and things that helped them, um, you know, survive in that scenario. I know that sounds very dramatic, but I'm sure that survival is an accurate way to describe what it's like being told that like who you are is wrong. I can't imagine how awful that must feel and what a battle it must be every day to try and reconcile with that. So um, like I said, if maybe there's somebody you want me to have on my channel that I can interview them and they can share their story, I think that would be really interesting. Um, so if there's anybody like that, or like I said, if there's anything more specific that you would want me to address that I feel I am capable of addressing in a responsible and helpful way. I would love to do that. And having said that, that is the last unanswered question from my NGL submissions. This was really fun. I enjoyed being able to speak about these questions that were asked anonymously. I do like addressing them on Instagram, but I feel like I'm so long-winded that it's really, really hard because when you do it through NGL, you can't respond with a video. You have to like do it through text. And so it's a whole thing. I don't even know where I was going with that. It's a whole thing to have to do it through text. I feel like I, I have so much to say that I like can't get it all out within text and I can't get the nuance and the details and all that. So it's fun to answer them verbally. Now, having said all that, I'm going to let you go. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. If you are watching this on YouTube, I would love if you would leave a comment sharing your thoughts on it down below. And while you were doing that, if you would consider liking this video or subscribing to my channel, that would be incredible. And if you are listening to the podcast and you want to leave a rating and review, I would be so incredibly grateful. And if you have done any of those things already, thank you so much. I am so appreciative of you. And I love being able to just sit here, hang out with you and talk about whatever. Thank you so much for watching. Please be kind to people and I will see you in the next one. Bye.